Welcome back. This is the Male Reproductive System. Your host, Shea Spencer. Um, this will be probably divided up into, into two different lectures. Uh, I'll give you guys a brief overview. Uh, I'm going to actually start shortening these videos, making them a little shorter. I'm um, just kind of giving you all some highlights, some high yield points. Um, I'll get your feedback in class and see what you guys think. But just a brief overview, there is um, a group of different um, organs located within the male reproductive system. You're going to have the testes, um, which are going to be the internal structures. You'll have external structures that are uh, that's going to consist of the scrotum. This is going to be primarily used for support. Um, We'll show a picture here. This is going to be primarily su for support. You're going to have a series of structures. Uh, this is the epididymis. This is going to be where sperm mature, um, which you can't see on here. You're going to have uh, the vas deferens, which is going to um, lead to the ejaculatory duct and eventually into the urethra and out here to the penis. Um, this is going to be the route in which sperm travel. Going back up here, um, you're going to have some accessory sex glands, and all these are going to do is provide fluid. This is going to provide uh, um, fluid for um, the sperm. It's going to be consist of the seminal vesicles and the prostate, and those are going to provide different nutrients each for the sperm for them to be able to survive. Um, important here is the cremaster muscle. The cremaster muscle is going to be a muscle that's going to, its primary function is going to be to raise and lower the testes. Uh, there's something called the cremasteric reflex that I'll show you on this next slide. Cremaster muscle is, again, a muscle that's used to raise and lower the testes. It responds also to temperature. So, uh, guys, if you go outside and it gets cold, as you know, the scrotum will shrivel in size, and that's due to the cremaster muscle itself. Uh, it's a branch of something called the ilioinguinal nerve. That's uh, the L1 to L2, uh, is that right? L1 to L2, maybe L1 to L4. But anyways, that's a branch of the lumbar plexus, which is a group of nerves present within the lumbar area itself. Um, there's a test that you can that you can do, a physical exam maneuver for patients coming in, uh, getting a genital exam. You can stroke the inner thigh, and the uh, let's say you stroke the right side of the thigh, the right side of the scrotum should raise. And um, there's a pathology called testicular torsion in which this is usually absent absent and that means that there's usually nerve damage or a lack of blood supply coming to that area. Here's just a picture of the cremaster uh, area. Here is the uh, genital femoral, femoral nerve coming down here and this just goes to show you the area distribution. Again this is a picture uh, depicting the penis right here. There is a membranous and a, um, a membranous portion and a prostatic portion of the urethra. Up here you see the prostatic portion and you're getting into the membranous portion of the urethra here. Uh, here is the epididymis. It's a uh, actually sits on top of the testicle. This is where sperm mature. Here's the testes themselves. The testes is the actual internal oval shaped structure and the scrotum is the outer loose connective tissue that sits on top of the testicle. Within the testes themselves, themselves, you have two different um, muscles. You have the tunica vaginalis, which is going to be a serous membrane, and the tunica albiginea, which is going to be dense irregular connective tissue. What's important to know about the tunica albiginea is that um, within this dense irregular connective tissue, you have uh, a separation of compartments, actually called lobules. And I'll show you that. And those lobules are going to divide up and form septum. Within those septum, they're going to have different cells called the Sertoli cells. The Sertoli cells are going to be responsible for producing sperm. So again, the tunica albiginea is separated into different lobules, uh, separated by septum. And those are going to consist of different cells. The Sertoli cells produce sperm. Sertoli for sperm and the Leydig cells produce testosterone. So I remember Sertoli for sperm, Leydig cells produce testosterone. I don't know how to remember or how to give you a mnemonic to remember testosterone. Um, 
the are they are they respond to different hormones. If you remember from the endocrine chapter, there was gonadotropin releasing hormone or GnRH, which come from the hypothalamus. Uh, the hypothalamus was responsible for producing FSH and LH from the pituitary. Uh, FSH will primarily come down to the Sertoli cells and be responsible for the formation of uh, spermatogenesis and or sperm and then the LH will come down to the Leydig cells and cause testosterone to be produced. So LH for Leydig cells within the L. Um, the tunica vaginalis, that's an, this is an important structure whenever you are talking about pathology, primarily um, something called a hydrocele. This is just an area of inflammation. Again, we have the serous membrane that is going to form the tunica vaginalis. So uh, within the serous membrane, inflammation can occur during birth um, or different uh, other pathology and can cause fluid to build up. There is a physical exam maneuver that you can do called the translumination test, and you can take a pin light or um, uh, and any, of, any other kind of light, and you can shine it through, and you can see actually the fluid um, as it will transilluminate. Here's a picture depicting a hydrocele. Uh, as you can see here, the tunica vaginalis. This is this uh, dense irregular connective tissue here. And then you have the testes and the epididymis here sitting on top of the testes themselves. And then here is the hydrocele. The hydrocele is just going to be this fluid connection uh, that exists between the parietal and the visceral layer of the tunica vaginalis. This is another picture. This is kind of just showing you what is all present within something called the spermatic cord. Uh, the spermatic cord is going to consist of a group of blood vessels and nerves. Again, you'll have the cremaster muscle, which is depicted here. You'll have the genital femoral nerve, which is going to be supplying this uh, area of cremaster muscle within the inguinal canal. Uh, this blue uh, group of vessels here, this is called the pampiniform flex plexus, and this is respons responsible for blood drainage of the testy. Um, this artery that's coming in here, this is the testicular artery, which is going to bring blood supply to the area. There's pathology that exists called a testicular torsion. Uh, this can happen what we call idiopathically or just um, on, on its own. Uh, we don't really know why. Or it can happen during injury due to a fall or some type of trauma, kids horse playing or the kid gets struck there. Uh, and what happens is this group, uh, the spermatic cord actually twists on itself. And obviously there can be a several groups of uh, several reasons for a problem here. You can have a cutoff of venous drainage from the uh, pampiniform plexus, or you could stop arterial supply to the testes themselves. We could test for the cremastic reflex and see if there's compromise of the muscle, and that would be stroking of the inner thigh. That would uh, mean failure of uh, the cremaster muscle to raise the testes, and obviously that would be a medical emergency. We would need to get in and um, restore uh, blood supply. This is a cross-section here uh, showing you a little bit uh, more in-depth view these are going to be the blood vessels and nerves. Again, this is part of that pampiniform plexus. Um, I won't get into all of these different areas here. This is the tunica albuginea uh, right here. And you can see here within this tunica albuginea, these different septum right here forming these lobules. Septum is just going to be this division here. Um, within these are going to be the seminiferous tubules, which is going to be where sperm actually are produced. And it makes sense because the Sertoli cells lie within this tunica albuginea. This tunica vaginalis is going to be this more serous layer out here. And this is actually where the hydrocele itself forms. This is a picture of a human testes without the scrotum, without that loose connective tissue. Uh, this is the testy itself, this oval structure here. And it's covered by this dense... Um, area of this um, connective tissue called the tunica albuginea. 
on top of the testy, we said this was the epididymis. This is where sperm mature again. This is the spermatic cord. And again, this spermatic cord was just this picture here that you were seeing um, with the blood supply and the nerves. Uh, again, the venous drainage, this blue area. This is the panpiniform plexus. Panpiniform plexus here, the testicular veins. And this red area here is the testicular artery. And that's all present within that spermatic cord. The ductus deferens, this was uh, connects to the seminiferous tubules where the sperm are produced, right? And it goes to the epididymis here. And then eventually it goes um, to the uh, ductus deferens or the vas deferens to the ejaculatory duct then eventually out to the urethra, and then to the penis. This is an important picture here. Um, I think there's a few important points. Just want to show you that spermatogonium is what begins our process, and these are diploid uh, during meiosis. Remember, meiosis from bio-137 and bio-113, or 112. We talk about the spermatogonium forming, and eventually we form the primary spermatocyte. Um, what I think is important is the step between the primary spermatocyte and the secondary spermatocyte. Uh, secondary spermatocyte is actually haploid. So you begin with a diploid or um, two N chromosomes, 46 chromosomes, and then through the different divisions, we wind up producing this secondary spermatocyte, which is haploid, or half the number of chromosomes. After after we have the formation of the secondary spermatocyte, we then begin undergoing sperm maturation in which um, a, a bunch of different processes occur. Um, I, I, what I think is important is the most mature form of the sperm cell is called the spermatozoon. The spermatozoon is the most mature form of the sperm and um, that usually is something that test writers like to ask. I want to ask two questions. They like to ask, um, at what stage does uh, sperm become haploid? And it's from the transition from the primary spermatocyte to the secondary. And they like to ask you which of the following is the most mature form of the um, sperm. And it's the spermatozoon. Here's just another picture if some of you guys are visual. Um, this is the spermatogonium, spermatogonium undergoing mitosis, again, forming that to end that diploid state. And from here, you have division occurring. You have the primary spermatocyte. We're still to end diploid. We have the uh, tetrad formation, the crossing over. We know this is responsible for genetic heterogeneity or uh, forming genetic variation, right? What makes us unique? And then you have the secondary spermatocyte forming here. Uh, this is, um, again, this is going to be the stage in which you have a haploid or half the number of chromosomes. And then from here, we form four sperm. And then again, spermatozoa, which are um, uh, spermatozoon being the most mature form. And again, you know the Sertoli cells uh, depicted over here. Um, over here, this is going to be where um, sperm are uh, forming. And within the Sertoli cells, they respond to FSH, which comes from the pituitary. And we know that the Sertoli cells lie within the tunica albigenia, which is that dense irregular connective tissue. And that's where also the seminiferous tubules lie. This is a um, better picture here of the Sertoli cell. You see depicted over here is the basement membrane is lying right here. This is a transverse section. As you can see, it divides it into the superior and inferior portions. This is a spermatid, uh, more mature form. You can see here the primary spermatocyte going to a secondary spermatocyte and eventually to a spermatid. Uh, Sertoli cells do secrete a a number of different um, hormones. Uh, 
anti-mullerian hormone is secreted during the early stages of the bloth. Um, <clears throat> what's also important is knowing that uh, inhibin, inhibin um, is secreted. I think this is probably one of the most important hormones that we'll talk about uh, in regards to the Sertoli cell. Uh, inhibin is going to be responsible for that negative feedback on um, FSH. So once FSH comes down and we are beginning to produce enough sperm, uh, inhibin is produced and it goes back and inhibits FSH uh, production. We have androgen binding protein which is responsible for sperm maturation and estradiol um, through the uh, production of aromatase. Aromatase converts testosterone into estradiol. The Leydig cells. Leydig cells are going to release a series of hormones called androgens. And again, I told you in the earlier slide that Leydig cells produce testosterone. They um, increase something called cholesterol desmolase activity. This is needed in order to produce a variety of hormones. Um, but the one that we're primarily uh, going to discuss is going to be testosterone. It also produces something called androcenedione. But uh, for our purposes, we'll talk about testosterone. Follicle stimulating hormone increases the response of Leydig cells to LH by increasing the number of LH receptors expressed on the Leydig cells. Here's a very good picture. I think this kind of shows you um, this kind of shows you uh, the female the female version. Well, you've got pulsatile GnRH, which produces FSH from the pituitary and LH from the pituitary. LH comes here to cause cholesterol desmolase to make androgens testosterone. Again, this is talking about in the female reproductive cycle, but again, uh, it's good just for the physiological purposes, not necessarily the anatomical purposes. This is another picture here just showing you uh, the varying different stages of sperm development. As you can see here, the closer in you get, the more mature um, sperm that you're uh, going to get within the seminiferous tubules. Um, here uh, you can see the uh, the darker coloration here. This is going to be sperm that's early in maturation. Um, but the closer you get, the more mature sperm are going to be occurring. This here, this picture here, is going to discuss the hormonal control of spermatogenesis. Again, the hypothalamus is going to produce something called gonadotropin releasing hormone. Gonadotropin releasing hormone is going to cause an increase in LH and FSH from the pituitary. Um, LH is going to stimulate testosterone secretion. It's going to cause the Leydig cells to secrete testosterone. Testosterone through an enzyme called 5 alpha reductase will produce DHT. DHT is responsible for a variety of things. We won't necessarily cover that right now. Um, we've talked about LH um, increasing testosterone secretion uh, from the Leydig cells. FSH goes down to the Sertoli cells and causes an increase in um, and androgen binding protein. Androgen binding protein is responsible for sperm maturation. Um, as the Sertoli cells um, have produced enough sperm, they will uh, also secrete inhibin inhibin together with testosterone will um, um, decrease the release of FSH and LH respectively. So here's some uh, note the feedback in, uh, inhibition and hormone flow from endocrine gland to endocrine gland. Again, we know that uh, the hypothalamus releases gonadotropin releasing hormone and that in return causes the pituitary to secrete FSH and LH. LH causes the Leydig cells to secrete testosterone. This testosterone will have a negative feedback on GnRH and LH. So once enough testosterone is produced, it will actually inhibit production from the hypothalamus and the pituitary. Um, on this other side, you see that FSH, once it responds to gonadotropin-releasing hormone, inhibin actually comes up and inhibits FSH production. So you've got testosterone working on the Leydig cell side, and inhibiting the GnRH and the LH, right, respectively, while the Sertoli cells produces inhibin to decrease the release of FSH. This is that homeostatic mechanism that we've been discussing in class.
What type of hormone function do you see in the Leydig cells? Well, they're producing androgens, right? We know that LH increases that cholesterol desmolase activity, which increases the production of testosterone. Uh, what type of hormone interaction do you see with FSH and testosterone? We see that, remember from the previous slide, we said that testosterone, um, along with FSH, is going to increase the LH receptors present. Or, I'm sorry, FSH is going to increase the amount of LH receptors present on the Leydig cells, which will increase testosterone production. This slide here is just more or less talking about <clears throat> how sperm are, uh, what they're composed of. They have a head, a neck, a midpiece, and an endpiece. The head is going to contain the nucleus. It's going to contain around 23 chromosomes. Remember, it's haploid, and we know it's haploid due to that division from the primary to the secondary spermatocyte. Um, also, is an acrosome. This is a vesicle field. Um, this is where the... Um, the oocyte penetrating enzymes are present. Um, you have a neck which contains the centrioles from the microtubules, which are responsible for movement. Uh, the midpiece, it's important to know the midpiece contains the mitochondria. Um, again, M for mitochondria, and midpiece contains the mitochondria. And the endpiece is the terminal tapering portion of the tail. Um, of note, once ejaculated, sperm did not survive more than 48 hours in a female reproductive tract. Got a picture here. Here's the acrosome. This contains the enzymes which penetrate the egg. Uh, within the head, we, we know we have the nucleus, which contains the 23N chromosomes. Uh, this is the neck as well, which contains the centrioles. Uh, centrioles are composed of microtubules. We know that microtubules are responsible for movement. The midpiece here, this is the, or the middle piece, contains the mitochondria, M for mitochondria. And then here's the end piece. The end piece contains the terminal tapering portion of the tail. Uh, this is just more sperm specifics. You guys don't have to know these um, for the exam, but I just think some of this is interesting. Um, average survival, again, is one to two days in the female reproductive tract. This is because of the acidity present within the female reproductive tract, the acidity of the, um, of the vaginal canal uh, helps break down that sperm. 10% uh, of semen rests from the seminal vesicle and prostate. Again, we said the prostate and the seminal vesicle is responsible for producing fluid, which help um, the sperm become semen. Uh, normal ejaculation is between 200 to 500 million sperm. I think that's uh, pretty remarkable, which means that we, um, if you're sitting in this class or listening to this, you were the one sperm that uh, penetrated the egg in order to form the um, embryo, which later on, uh, formed you, right? Uh, lifetime for fertility. We know that's not uh, true for women as they undergo uh, menopause, but men have a lifetime fertility. Technically, men could um, conceive until um, they die. Uh, it's not necessarily fair, but I guess that's the way the uh, normal physiology works. Sperm produced uh, 1,500 per second, 100 days for maturation. Uh, we'll cover a few more slides here. Actually, I think this is a good stopping point. Um, we've been through, uh, we've been through uh, spermatic maturation. We've been through. Um, just some basic anatomy and good, some good introduction. We've, you primarily have all the physiology uh, discussed. Uh, the next will be more about anatomy, things like that. So if you guys have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Other than that, uh, I'll see you guys in class.